So hello everyone and uh, welcome to our Center for Mindfulness Science keynote speaker event for today. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, today we are lucky to have Dr. Natalia Marone uh, speaking to us from Boston. And um, this in a way is kind of uh, continuing the theme from our last talk when uh, Dr. Christiana Wolf spoke about her work uh, really supporting people in uh, dealing with chronic pain uh, using mindfulness as a teacher and that recent book of hers, Art Outsmart Your Pain, that she spoke about on our last event. And this time we have a speaker who has a lot of experience delving into the research on exactly how much efficacy um, mindfulness interventions can have for uh, a really common comic, uh, chronic pain condition that is such a big public health burden, uh, chronic low back pain. Um, so Dr. Marone is dual certified in internal medicine and pediatrics and is an associate professor of medicine at Boston University School of Medicine and the Boston Medical Center. She grew up in both Ann Arbor, Michigan and Venezuela and completed her undergraduate at Barnard College in biology and went to medical school at Michigan State University. She began meditating at the age of 19 and after personally experiencing the benefits of meditation, um, this piqued her interest into researching. And she completed a research fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh. And over the past 18 years, she's established her research career in integrative non-pharmacologic interventions to treat chronic pain with a real focus on mindfulness. I've been following her work for about 15 years myself. And um, she's done a lot of uh, really top notch randomized control trial type studies funded by the NIH, um, but also exploring into some of the qualitative uh, impact of mindfulness that some um, you know, questionnaire based assessments kind of miss out on. That was one of the unique contributions to the field I felt she made early on and I think helps uh, explain this kind of more in-depth look at the effect to know that she herself was uh, gaining benefits from mindfulness and wanting to explore some of the things that are missed with questionnaire-based approach. Maybe um, she may be able to speak with us a little bit about that theme, but in general, she's a widely recognized expert in mindfulness interventions, especially for chronic low back pain, uh, probably the world's uh, expert in that. And her research portfolio extends into mindfulness delivered via electronic health or e-health, telehealth as well. She's principal investigator of the optimizing pain treatment in medical settings using mindfulness, optimum pragmatic clinical trial, which she will discuss today. And also has an active clinical practice in internal medicine there at Boston University. So Dr. Marone, thank you again very much for joining us today and really looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really um, excited to speak with everybody today. Yes, I am Natalia Marone. And let me, um, let me share my screen. All right, that should be visible to you now. It is. Okay, all right. So again, uh, thanks again for inviting me. It's really an honor to speak with you. Um, the, the, my, my talk is titled The Evidence in Therapeutic, Therapeutic Use of Mindfulness for Chronic Low Back Pain. I really would like having this, have a, a Zoom talk is even those folks who maybe sit quiet in the back of a, of a talk, you know, really please feel free and feel at home to ask any questions that you might have, even if, out, if it's outside of, of the topic for today. So um, I am talking about pain. So I'm gonna be talking about defining and modeling pain. 
looking at the evidence for mindfulness for chronic low back pain, its therapeutic use for people who have uh, chronic low back pain, and then a little bit at the end talking about um, my current research project where I want to move where, where, where the next steps are, I think, in, in the field. I think it's, it's important to keep in mind that low back pain is the number one cause of disability worldwide. It's very common. The other thing that's common is um, symptoms like depression, anxiety, catastrophizing, and decreased self-efficacy are associated with an increased risk of disability. Also point out that self-efficacy psychological distress and fear all partially mediate the relationship between back pain and disability. The reason I'm pointing out the disability is for many patients, it's not only the pain that's the problem, but it's the fact that it causes them disability. They can't function in their ordinary day-to-day -day activities that they would like to do. And back problems are some of the up in the 10 most expensive medical conditions in the United States, even though this data is from 2008, that really hasn't changed. And then I wanna take a little bit again to emphasize the mood disorders that can be coexistent with chronic pain. And indeed, anybody who does research in chronic pain has to look at um, mood and anxiety disorders because frequently depression and pain, they coexist and the presence of pain will negatively impact uh, depression treatment, but um, depression also neg negatively impacts pain. Um, so this is very important to keep in mind. So Rao mentioned, I am trained in internal medicine and pediatrics. I, I see patients in internal medicine now, and I've learned that when my patients have pain, I need to ask about comorbid psychiatric conditions, particularly depression and anxiety, because it will make it more difficult to treat both the pain and the depression. They both work to, to make it more difficult to address. So depression, is, as mentioned, is also associated with increased pain and disability. Um, and it's also interestingly associated with the decreased pain threshold. So now, you know, I gave you some facts um, and facts are nice. They're very important. Uh, science and people like to know facts, but also there's something about those facts that doesn't really bring to life what it is to live with chronic pain. Uh, the, the suffering that people endure is somehow not brought up, you know, it's, it's not brought to life with that data. So, so this is a quote from one of the participants in, in one of the main clinical trials that I did for mindfulness for chronic, chronic low back pain. And this person illustrates several things that I think um, is true for people that are suffering for, for, from chronic pain, and in particular chronic low back pain. So, the person uh, says, it was something that had the power to grip me, a stabbing knife, something that had mechanical power to grab me and inject pain into me. It was something out of a monster show that could grab you and hurt you. I'm reading these in case there's people listening in who don't have access to their screen, so I apologize if you'd rather me be quiet while you're reading it. So the couple things that I wanted to point out is that they really, the image of, the, of a monster, so this, and kind of solidifying the pain into a monster that actually can grab them at any point and what they're grabbing them with is with a knife and, and the power that that pain has over that person. So I really want for the audience to take a moment if you don't have chronic pain yourself, what that must be like and what that means to live with something like this on a daily basis. So now let's go back to how pain is defined. I, this is the accepted definition from the International Association for the Study of Pain. And they describe it as both 
an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And now that I've gone over some of the effects of chronic pain and depression and anxiety and disability, so some of those more emotional rea um, reactions to pain and consequences of pain and comorbid conditions with pain, along with the quote that that participant um, who had chronic pain, how they describe their pain in a very um, vivid way. I think it helps to explain why for a long time researchers have known who do pain research that pain is much more than a sensory experience. And here they talk about the, they discuss the emotional component of pain um, in their um, definition. Up to date is a medical resource that I use all the time when I'm seeing patients. So, um, you know, in the middle of seeing a patient, if I have a question, I'll look up what's called up to date. And so I wanted to add what they say about chronic pain because they, they help to illustrate uh, on a bigger, uh, a broader level pain also, the definition of chronic pain. And so they describe chronic pain as results from the combined biologic, psychologic, and social factors, and most often requires a multifactorial approach to management. So recognizing that pain from the get-go is complex and that treatment of chronic pain is going to be more complex. So now let's shift um, to looking at this biopsychosocial model of pain. Um, this is really just a broad model. Um, nowadays, this is how we view, pain. we view pain. It's not just the biological sensations of pain causing pain. Um, the biology is important. It's, it, it includes all the central mechanisms that are involved, the brain processing of pain, which I will tell you is a huge and complex field in and of itself. But there's also the peripheral um, processing of pain. There's um, also um, any like uh, hormonal or other types of neurochemicals involved in the process of pain. So the biology of pain alone is, is very, very complex. But then you have the psychology, which I've already alluded some to, factors like anxiety and depression that might be involved. But you also have the social components to pain. And um, this might be cultural factors that influence um, how you experience pain yourself. So when you start looking at this model, starting to think about, well, how, how, how do you experience pain? What's, what, what is that like, like for you? So there's, 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 um, so there's cultural factors that, that, that could be involved with your experience of pain, as well as any number of other attributes. For example, people in chronic pain very frequently become socially isolated. Um, and that's, that could contribute to depression and make their pain worse. So what's interesting about these different aspects, the biology, the psychology, and the social factors that influence pain is that it's, all of this is bi-directional. So, so in any of these, in any of these areas, if you improve one, it could potentially improve the chronic pain. But if you worsen it, it could also worsen the chronic pain. And I want to keep. I want you to keep this in mind because I had a reporter. I think he interviewed me just like three weeks ago. It wasn't very long ago, and it was, it's about it was about car, about a cognitive behavioral therapy that was going to be used. Um, um, that uh, uh, kind of like a device that was approved for chronic pain, and it, it entailed a CBT. Um, and he just, he just couldn't understand how a psychological approach could decrease pain. Um, and so while I won't go into the biology of the central mechanisms, there is absolutely a top-down regulation of pain that, that, that can occur. Um, and when I read you a couple of the quotes from participants, it's clear that that's what they're engaging in. So I really, um, 
want everyone to keep in mind how how um, how multifactorial um, a pain is, and and what actually is involved in in your personal and in and other people's experience of chronic pain. And then within that biopsychosocial model, this is a very early model of pain by Melzack back in the 60s, where they're dis describing pain as having sensory components, cognitive components, and affective components. Clearly sensory is, you know, if, if you touch a hot stove, that's the sensory component to pain. The cognitive might be any thoughts that you have around the pain. And then the act, act, affective is uh, your emotional reaction. And frequently the cognitive affective components can overlap. And again, all of these different components influence each other. So as the affective component worsens, worsens treating chronic pain could be worse. I just I showed uh, described that earlier when I was discussing um, depression, but it can also um, um, the other uh, I described catastrophizing earlier that when people catastrophize the the their their experience of pain is is worse. So there's these different there's there's these different areas of pain which, would, given the previous talks you've heard, they they might. You, you may have been presented these ideas before, but I want you to keep these in mind because I think they're very, very relevant to mindfulness. So now let's shift gears a second and take a look at some of the evidence. So we're gonna now shift from discussing a little bit of the background on pain to let's discuss some of the important evidence that's come out in the last five years or so regarding the benefits of mindfulness for people who have chronic low back pain. And my colleague, Dan Churkin, um, published a randomized controlled, actually, yeah, randomized controlled trial of 342 people. And they um, were randomized either to a traditional MBSR mindfulness program, mindfulness-based stress reduction, to cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, or to usual care. And the groups were followed over for 52 weeks. And this was for patients who were 65, people who were 65 and under. And you will see that the bottom line is the blue line, usual care. And while there was some improvement in these folks, generally um, it was significantly less than the folks who were either in the brownish line, which is the mindfulness group, or in the gray line, which was the cognitive behavioral therapy group. And so this is the percentage of people, which is around 30 to 32% that rated their pain as much better or completely gone. And remember, this is with just a mindfulness program that they're, that they're saying that their pain is much better or completely gone. Now, I want to take a step now and look at uh, the trial that I did, and this was with older adults older adults, it was 282 older adults. Um, and our design was a little different. Um, they all also got the eight week mindfulness-based stress reduction program, which met weekly, but it was actually compared to an active control. So I very purposely set it up so that we controlled for everything. We controlled for the time and attention of meeting weekly for eight weeks in a group with an instructor that the, that the comparison, the control group was really beloved. So both instructors were really well liked. So I was really trying to control for the in influence of just being in a group because we know that just being in a group gets people better. Two important outcomes in any um, chronic pain uh, trial is gonna be function or disability and pain. And so you will see the RMDQs of Roland and Morris, that's a disability questionnaire. And these are people who have, who have clinically meaningful change. We're not just interested in statistical, um, uh, in statistical significance, but really clinically meaningful significance. And so this is a change of two and a half points on the RMDQ 
and a change of 30% in their pain. And you can see at eight weeks and six months, both groups, um, still the intervention, the MBSR, which was the intervention group, still maintained and is in blue, um, maintain their improvement over six, six months. And we see that in function, we see an improvement at eight weeks, but that this stabilized at, at six months. So it was no longer significant at six months, although frankly, both, both groups really improved quite a bit in function at six, um, by six months. Dr. Maron, can I ask a question about the combination of these two last um, studies you summarized? Absolutely. So one thing I, um, I noticed is that the CBT, it looked like there probably wasn't a statistical significantly different effect, but the CBT seemed to be performing, um, you know, its effect, efficacy was um, a little bit greater, especially earlier in the just post eight weeks. Um, and then by the one year post, they really were basically about the same. Um, but that's not a statistically significant difference, I take it. Otherwise, it would probably be noted on the chart there, right? Um, right. And I, the, the question is just, you know, what might help account for the difference between this? Like, what's, what was present in that CBT that Shirkin and colleagues um, used as their control condition compared to what was present in the um, health education program or, or the, the, the control group? intervention that you compared the mindfulness to. Um, and overall, efficacy is hard to really directly compare between these two studies because they used a different metric, right? Much better completely on versus um, a, a cutoff that you define for the RMDQ. Um, but I'm just wondering if you can say anything about whether the data point to a, an overall difference in efficacy or if, um, if it, it, it was too different in how that was assessed to even be able to compare the two in overall efficacy of the mindfulness. So in terms of the, in terms of Dan's study, Dr. Churkin's study, really the difference between C, with CBT and mindfulness, but not being statistically different, I can't really comment on what we're seeing there that might've been the difference. So well, I can't hypothesize there. I will tell you that actually we had, I'll show you um, when I move forward a little later, I'll show you how participants in our study rated how, they, how, how much better they felt they were. Um, and that would compare to this one. I think we have to keep in mind this, he had 30% of people at 52 weeks. I'm gonna show you six, uh, six month data. And you'll see that we're a little bit higher, actually, in our study. Um, so, there, so there's actually more similarities than you would think. The other one was that he actually used the RMDQ. Um, he just used a 30% improvement. I used the two and a half um, point difference. And I'll show you, um, was I going to show you? I'll, so I'll show you some of that data now. So you can see that actually you, pro you can actually uh, combine some of it because of similar outcomes we, like the RMDQ that we used as, as well as the numeric rating scale. So this question was, how much have your back pain symptoms changed as a result of the treatment provided in this study? And this was six months, which was the main time point for the study. In, in black, which is mainly towards the left, is the treatment group or the mindfulness-based stress reduction group. And towards the right is the um, the, the comparison or the control group. So it's not exactly the same question as he asked where it was, you know, completely better. But what I want to point out is the much improved and the very much improved um, is, is 45%. So at six months, 45% of folks were saying they were much improved or very much improved. Um, and I've always been very happy with this result because I feel that people who, who say minimally improved may be just trying to, you know, as, as a researcher, they may try to be making, making us happy with, with that response, but I don't feel that people would overinflate much improved or very much improved. Um, and Dan's, I think, was around 20, 20, 30%. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, I think this does help more directly compare um, the efficacy across the two studies and it kind of uh, supports what I was intuiting might be the case, which is that overall it does look like maybe your mindfulness groups somehow exerted greater benefits than the mindfulness groups that they implemented. And there could be many different reasons uh, that might help explain that. Um, and I think that's really one of the outstanding um, you know, questions in, in our field about, well, why is it that sometimes we see you know, uh, maybe it's some teacher or some uh, particular, you know, the selection of this particular group, it's just more ideally uh, suited to really gain the benefits and another group that maybe wasn't that interested or, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, choosing it without being so informed and or motivated about it, you know, maybe they are not as, as likely, but some combination of the, the population and the teacher and the match between the two seem to be, um, you know, contributing to some pretty wide variance when you compare different studies with each other. I, I couldn't agree more. And it's, it's a really, it, it is really tricky. We did have very skilled um, instructors. And this is, um, I, think I'm at, I think I mentioned these were older adults. Our study was 65 and older and his was under 65. So the population is different, is different. Um, and I think all of those factors can contribute. It's probably not one. Then uh, what I wanted also to, to show you, because I'd I remember one of the first slides was decreased self-efficacy was associated with more pain. And so uh, we did ask the chronic pain self-efficacy scale, um, and it's divided into different um, domains. Um, and you will see that um, they, um, you will see that it's all patients divided into the intervention and the control group, effect sizes, and then the, the adjusted group differences and then the overall group by time P value. And you will see that um, chronic pain self-efficacy was actually uh, significant at all time points. And what we didn't get to publish in the main paper because we just didn't have space for it was that this also mediated uh, some of the response to mindfulness, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it and it's consistent with, with, with the literature on self-efficacy. So, so I do think that this is an important measure to keep in mind when, when you're doing um, mindfulness studies. And then I showed you, this is another way of looking at the data I showed you, except the difference for this one is I'm looking at a five-point improvement from the, R, from the RMDQ, the disability questionnaire, at eight weeks and six months. And I'm also looking at a, 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 at least a 50% decline in the numeric rating scale. So on a scale of zero, we use zero to 20. On a scale to, of zero to 20, you know, um, you know how, what's your average pain in the past week? What's your current pain today? And what's your most severe pain um, rating for the past week? So in this scale, um, if you ask patients what's most important to, to, to them, though they're like they're more likely to say a 50% improvement in their pain. So this is more a patient-centered um, data of what a patient would value in terms of their pain improvement. Um, though we still consider 30% clinically significant. So I'm showing this uh, to you to show that at six months we're we're seeing significant um, continued improvement in how they describe their oh, at least a 50% improvement in their pain. Remember, this is mindfulness oh, um, program that we're, we're teaching them. Their most severe pain didn't quite reach clinical significance, um, but, but uh, nevertheless, I think there was probably a trend. Did you collect data about how much people were continuing to practice and whether that was related to this difference between groups? I think that, um, so quite a few people were continuing to do informal practice and less and less more formal practice. And I think that that could, that could be related, but we didn't do the formal analysis. 
And part of the reason is, is as much as we tried to collect that data of continued practice, it was actually really hard. That log data and just how much people are actually practicing, which everyone always wants, wants to know is, is very hard to, I don't know if you've discussed that in these different, you probably have, but it can be, it can be, there, it can be challenging to do it accurately. And then, and then, uh, and the other thing that we collected was their expectancy. And basically a baseline expectancy from both groups was the same in terms of how much did they feel that the workshop, workshop series would, would help to reduce their pain. Okay, so now let's switch gears. I just went over the, um, the evidence for you. These were two very large controlled uh, studies that I just presented. They both had positive results. And we actually are looking at quite a range of age. Really, we're looking at all, all, adult, all adults for the studies. And so back in um, 2017, the American College of Physicians, it's since been adopted by other, uh, by other organizations, um, looking at how can we expand the treatment for patients who have chronic low back pain. This partially came in response to the opioid crisis, where it seems that the main funnel for patients' chronic pain was to give them an opioid. And chronic pain is thought to have been a driver for the current crisis. And so um, this, these recommendations were, were looking at all different types of therapies for that, that would be first line therapies for chronic low back pain, also acute and subacute pain. The American College of Physicians is the um, professional organization for general internists. And so I just wanna um, highlight, and I've highlighted there for you, that for patients with chronic low back pain, initially non-pharmacologic treatment should be selected and mindfulness-based stress reduction with moderate quality evidence was recommended. And this was based on the two studies I just presented to you, as well as one of my pilot studies. I was a little bit surprised they included a pilot study. So, but those three studies were um, what, what, um, what informed these guidelines. So now I wanna, you know, so I've given you different things to think about. I've given you things to think about in terms of the definition of pain, in terms of the, um, the model for thinking about pain, um, the evidence that has led to the recommendations for mindfulness-based stress reduction for, um, for, as a treatment, as a first-line treatment for patients who have chronic low back pain. And I wanna talk, turn a little bit to mindfulness because one of the things I kind of want to do is hopefully bring this all together for you so that um, you can think of pain the way that I do. And I really think of pain right now as a mind and body um, a disorder. And, and because of that, this is one of the reasons I think mindfulness is so well uh, suited to treat it. So I was reading this review and I really liked how they discuss the different things that mindfulness training enhances. So if you practice, if you're listening, for those listening, if you're practicing mindfulness, I want you to think about how this, whether you agree with this or not, or where, whether anything is missing, but it made a lot of sense to me. Um, and I've heard all of these things before, but I thought it was nice the way they laid it out. So we know that mindfulness training, um, enhances different capacities that we already have. These, this isn't anything new that mindfulness is tapping into, but, but, but it is new ways of enhancing those capacities um, and increase, increasing them. So this idea of meta-awareness, I think is very important to my mindfulness because it's your capacity to monitor your own thoughts, sensations, behaviors, emotions, et cetera. So while you are listening to me, you can be aware that you are listening to me, or you can be aware that you might be distracted and you need to come back to listening. So that, that meta-awareness of being able to observe yourself is a, a very important quality that we have that uh, mindfulness taps into. 
the present centered awareness is a very, very, very important. And through the um, methods of mindfulness and the methods of mindfulness meditation, really learning to maintain your present moment attention into what is occurring right now related to any thoughts, sensations, behaviors, emotions, et cetera, that's going on in the present moment. Very critical to mindfulness. Non-reactivity is very important. So being able to step back and take a moment to observe what's going on and then respond instead of reacting. The de-reification, I have always thought was a uh, was an awkward word, but it's the idea that our thoughts aren't aren't solid. I want to go back to the example where the person described their pain as a monster, really solidifying the thoughts around around their pain. Um, and then I think compassion is something for self and others that is being developed more and more within mindfulness training. I, I do think this is this is important. I don't think I have quotes today illustrating. It, but there are participants who realize they needed to have that self-care, self-kindness, self-compassion for themselves um, that they had stopped doing because of their pain, but also that compassion and patience and kindness for others. So again, keeping these in mind, um, I wanted to move to a, a couple of quotes. Um, so these are quotes that, the, that when we interviewed folks, we wanted um, to get their thoughts on the experience of mindfulness and how that related to their pain. Because I just gave you the quantitative evidence. It reduces their pain in the short term, it improves their function, it improves how they cope with pain. And overall, they think it helps their pain. But let's not hear what they actually say about it. And this particular person talked about changing their fear and fear of pain is very real and leads to some very serious consequences. I didn't go into the, the fear of activity model of pain based within the biopsychosocial model, but it's definitely something that has driven a lot of research. So this person says that before learning mindfulness, I used to dread pain. And before when it would just be starting, I'd be getting pain medicine and you know, actually panicky. And I'm just not afraid of the pain anymore. I think that's why it doesn't come back. If it does come back, it's not bad. And I think that's why, because I actually went right into it and could see it wasn't all that bad. That's the way it's helped me. So I really, I think I'm packing this quote. There's a lot in this quote. One is, is the meta-awareness that I think this participant tuned into for mindfulness. And starting to be aware of her dread and her panic over the pain when it would start. Um, I also think it shows her learning non-reactivity um, because she was reacting with fear to the pain and she's discussing not being afraid of it anymore. Um, the presence centered awareness is critical because she's becoming, I'm interpreting this as becoming aware of the pain early on, but then also go, moving into the pain, which is, um, you've seen John Kabat-Zinn describe that, which is just sitting with it, you know, not pushing it away, being with it. And that present centered awareness is, is critical to be able to do that so that you can watch your um, reactions to it. And then not so solidifying it. I think that idea of really dreading it really felt to me like she was really starting to uh, solidify her thoughts. So what I'm showing you is what I think some of the different ways that we think about what we're instructing people to learn when they're learning mindfulness. Um, I think this is an example of how this person used all of that um, to work with their fear. And what I didn't um, include in here, um, I, was, I was reviewing the article that we published it in but it reminded me because I did these interviews and I remember her talking about it. When she says she dreaded the pain and that she was panicky about it, it had gotten to the point that she was asking her brother to go purchase illicit drugs for her. And as a result of going through this uh, program, she wasn't doing that anymore. 
So, so the fact that that her fear had driven her to it is, um, well, it's it's really eye opening. Um, what patients are experiencing when they're in pain, and what it means to her that that's not the case anymore. And then the other important um, other important concept here is changing the significance of the pain. So when so this person says it doesn't have the significance that it had. Now, sometimes it can still take my breath away, you know, but it does not have the significance and power that I gave it at another early, or let's say prior to my beginning the mindfulness experience. It has less significance and less importance. Whenever somebody says this, I really think it's a success. Even though she'll say, you know, um, let me see, it's not here. But sometimes they'll talk about still having pain, but it just doesn't bother them, you know. So if it's not significant, it's less important. I think that's 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 very significant. Sorry to use the word twice, because again, the inability to function and do what you would like to do because of your chronic pain, being able to work through that and get beyond it is really important. So again, I think this person is using non, I'm, I'm sorry, I think they're using meta-awareness, non-reactivity, present-centered awareness and dereification. I really think they're using all of these skills to work with their chronic pain. And they potentially also are actually decreasing the experience of pain. So it's not just working with emotions of fear, for example, but also, uh, using that top-down um, diminishing of their pain that occurs with, that we know occurs with mindfulness. So then kind of bringing all of these models together, again, I think that mindfulness, the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program um, and what it's teaching you and engaging in those different areas that, that you're learning to expand and work with and in, increase awareness of what's going on with sensations, with your affect, with your thoughts, that being present in the moment, all of that that's being taught in mindfulness, I think works extremely well with pain and the pain model that was developed by pain uh, clinicians and pain scientists, you know, long before mindfulness came along. And this is why I think they well meld so well because pain does involve very strong emotional and affective components as I've gone over with you. It involves some very strong cognitive components. I, I discussed, I showed, I reviewed with you the quote of the person that it was like a monster. Um, and then of course there's a sensory experience and working with the sensory experience of pain. So not only now, I think to me, the gift of doing this research for so many years is being able to appreciate patients really from a very holistic point of view and understand that their pain has, is complex and has these, all these different components to it, but that mindfulness offers to them something to work with the complexity of, of pain. So hopefully I've done a little bit to convince you why I think um, mindfulness is so well suited to, to people who have pain and in particular chronic pain. I think we have one uh, question that came up just a little bit, bit ago that may fit well with this particular um, part of the presentation. Um, comes from uh, Pranav Shah and he's ask, asking about um, the combination of uh, like, are there any treatment programs that you're aware of or studies that have looked at pain relief based on a program combining CBT or ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy. It's kind of a, a type of CBT that actually does incorporate a fair amount of mindfulness instruction awareness around, um, but combining that with mindfulness. And, and just to preface the question, you know, uh, for those who know the mindfulness-based stress reduction model or the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy that typically, uh, you know, delivered um, group mindfulness therapies um, in, in the landscape today, um, they have a, a fair amount of a, a cognitive component to them. In other words, it's not just a teacher 
telling you, okay, we're going to meditate now. And, and then, you know, you're done with the class and you come back and okay, we'll meditate. <laughs> Instead, there's a, 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 a very active engagement with talking about what comes up when you meditate and how it's related to what comes up in daily life and essentially learning how to apply these skills that I, I, I like that review paper you brought these kind of particular domains of mindfulness out of as well, the dereification, non-reactivity, et cetera, but, but enhancing your uh, awareness that that's part of what you are doing as you engage with mindfulness. And so in some ways, you know, the standard mindfulness-based stress reduction is indeed a, a treatment program that combines CBT and mindfulness, right? That's kind of what I'm getting at, although even more formally for mindfulness-based cognitive therapy the, that's used for depression. But I think the, the question still stands, you know, are there some particular interventions that you're aware of looking at pain relief that combine maybe in a more uh, proactive manner, more components, for example, of CBT with the mindfulness um, just a question from the audience. That's a great question. I mean, there is the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy that has some very strong literature um, around it um, and is very effective. What I'm not, what I, so you generally won't see it compared head-to-head -head with MBSR because of that. I think it's very strongly an MBSR program, but with some CBT components to it. Um, Okay, if you teach it, if I said that wrong, you can you can correct me. But that's kind of how how I heard what it was. I, I think that's fair. You know, having having taught both, um, <laughs> yeah. You know, there's there's just more explicit psychoeducation from a CBT type model around the um, the cognition, feeling, um, kind of mood loops, and how you know that you know, cognitions do really contribute to the kindling for, you know, ending up from just a little bit of dysphoria to being back in a full-on depressive episode. Um, and there's, you know, that particular aspect of really bringing attention to that, those loops is not as explicitly focused on within MBSR. Correct. It's, it's not. And I, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a general internist. So I wouldn't even I don't even know how to go about that when I'm working with with people who who have low back pain. So, um, but for the ACT part, I'm not aware of a one to one comparison. I think so. Th there may be some out there, probably more on the pilot study, but the one to one comparison I haven't seen. Yeah, I'm not aware either. And a, a question from one of our psychiatrist colleagues um, has actually come up. I think. Um, Dr. Sugar is wanting to direct this question directly to you, so I'm going to uh, enable his audio. Yes, <laughs> thank, thank you, Rail. And maybe yeah. you might want to you might want to take a stab at this too. You know, I wonder, uh, you know, listening to your presentation, which uh, is very has been very uh, illuminating. Thank you for it. Um, but uh, but I was thinking, you know. Uh, there was some separation between the cognitive, uh, the CBT, and the mindfulness, but but you know it took a while and it wasn't always perfectly clean, and you know we talked about how uh, the MBSR has some of the cognitive uh, aspects to it, but I, and I hadn't thought of this before, but it seems like if you stop and think what you're doing in cognitive therapy itself, you're asking people to pay attention to their thoughts in a way they might not have paid attention before. So that sounds like certainly a component of mindfulness. So uh, I just wonder if, you know, maybe, uh, I mean, not in necessarily a bad way, but when you do these kinds of comparisons, one of the reasons that it's hard to find a big separation is because some of the gain you get from mindfulness is kind of inherent in doing CBT itself. Uh, what do you mean some of the data? No, I mean just some of the improvement that that there oh. that, that, that these two modalities may share some kind of fundamental um, uh, factors in common. I mean, I don't know if anyone's ever done any kind of factor analysis of what makes up CBT and what makes up mindfulness, but uh, I think there's some overlap. Is what I'm saying that it, that 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 you have to pay attention to, that to if you're a patient who is being treated with CBT, you're being instructed to notice your thoughts and to pay attention to how your thoughts evolve and how they relate to how you feel, all of which arguably is 
kind of like mindfulness. Agreed. I think um, absolutely agreed. I do think there's some overlap. Um, and I think that's probably why MBCT occurred because it was a natural, it's a natural fit. I know what's interesting about mindfulness is when we start to follow the breath or focus our attention, um, it starts to engage our physiology in a different way. And that, um, that, that settling that happens physiologically. So we know the heart rate comes down, our blood pressure gets better, our, our breathing slows, all of that that occurs because of the, of the meditation mindfulness practice itself I, I don't know how much that's part of CBT. And I think that's, that's also what enhanced, so probably separates out a little bit, some of the mindfulness. But I agree with you, there's overlap. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I, I would agree as well. And I do think that's um, something that, you know, the people in the, in the mindfulness kind of academic community have been um, noticing for some time is, you know, and you, if you look, if you go, go back to that last slide again, Dr. Marone, um, those, those, those skills of mindfulness, you know, there, there's really an explicit and, and even, um, you know, people have, of course, looking at the mindfulness measure, right, the five-factor mindfulness questionnaire or the, the mindful uh, acceptance of, uh, awareness uh, scale um, or activity awareness scale, but whichever one you look at, the, the number of studies have looked at those scales being generally uh, improved with any kind of uh, effective therapy. In other words, you know, these, this construct that we tend to, um, you know, think of as being related to mindfulness practice is really uh, generally related to well-being and being kind of accepting and, and present. <laughs> um, and that, you know, if you go through an effective therapy, that, that, quality of your, uh, you know, functioning is going to be increased. And even in particular, some of the skills of CBT are about all these things, you know, being greater awareness to what you're thinking instead of being on automatic pilot about it. It's just, there's the, I, I'd say the major difference is really just that thing that you pointed to Dr. Marone of, you know, there's this real um, kind of going into some depth with the experiential kind of immersion into inner experience, you know, both the body and through the breath of relaxation and, um, and you know, by, by spending time with no particular goal for what to think about or, you know, analysis of how to think about what you're thinking that, you know, you're kind of more actively engaged with that in the CBT model. Um, you know, some more subtle things that may come up that, you know, can be connected to deeper kind of existential meaning type stuff sometimes for some people, or can also be just, a, you know, an opportunity for, um, you know, unconscious things to come to the surface that might not have come to the surface if you didn't really settle in in that way. Um, and uh, any individual, I think this, you know, kind of this is in some ways like the crux of the matter of like, well, for whom is mindfulness really most effective for? Is it most effective for people who, you know, have a inclination towards deeper reflection and, you know, maybe for people who are not especially inclined that way, uh, CBT maybe it works better. And maybe that's why, you know, uh, your colleagues work found a little bit of a better performance of CBT. These are younger people, maybe a little bit more actively engaged in their daily kind of responsibilities and just kind of inclined to stay a little bit more engaged and, and active in their mind and not so much, you know, uh, gravitating towards uh, deeper reflection. Um, but I do think, you know, it's just a very valid point that CBT has an overlap um, in terms of the basic core skills it's trying to teach with what mindfulness seems to be doing as you engage with the practice. And I will say just as a reflection for you, Dr. Marone, that the, the questioner um, is a psychiatrist. The initial question about combining CBT, ACT mindfulness studies, he, he just, you know, followed up to say the reason he brought this question up for you is that he's a psychiatrist with Kaiser Permanente and he teaches mindfulness in a chronic pain program that combines ACT, 
the acceptance commitment therapy and the mindfulness and movement therapy taught by a physical therapist and have found it to be fairly successful, although they haven't done any formal studies to evaluate the results. So that's kind of where that question was coming from. Well, I, I, I love that. And, and, and if you wanted to pursue that, I would, I would encourage you to do that. There's just one other thing that, Raya, what you were talking about, just um, one of the things to keep in mind that we do is just not paying attention to the thoughts, but being aware when we become distracted and bringing our attention back to whatever the object of meditation is, frequently the breath. And that starts developing the habit of learning to be more present and less pulled away by thoughts. I remember one of my colleagues asking who, who was anxious about something, you know, but how could she just stop? She couldn't stop thinking about it. And the idea of letting go, that's so central to mindfulness. And when we notice, you know, we're stuck on something, continually letting go, those are actually have really good habits that we're developing through the, through the mindfulness um, methods that we're doing, which, which I don't know if that's, that's taught in other, um, in other therapies like the CBT. All right, so let me let me just talk a little bit about um, the next steps and what I'm doing now. Now I am aware that if people have to leave right now, Yael, they I guess they can. Oh, but I'll I'll keep going and and just to finish up. I'm getting close. Yeah, and um, just as a reminder for everyone, the model we have is um, you know we, we will go until 1:30 if if there are enough questions until then or um, until the questions are. Are, are all answered. So um, I just reviewed uh, very good evidence for, for, for mindfulness and particularly mindfulness as taught through mindfulness-based stress reduction um, uh, to treat chronic low back pain that it's, it's now a clinical guideline. It's picked up by other organizations as clinical guidelines for treatment of, of chronic pain, but it's really still underutilized. It's not woven into outpatient clinical setting. Um, and part of that is, is um, I'm a general internist and, and for the most part, we're used to seeing a patient one-on-one -on -one in small room small rooms, small exam rooms, not um, a group setting. So that's definitely a barrier for its utilization in primary care, which I'm interested in as a primary care clinician. It's not routinely reimbursed by health insurance for low back pain. And so really for me, the next step was how, how to inform this program, you know, um, how can it work in a real life setting? And so that's what led me to proposing this to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, which is we call the Optimum Study, which is optimizing pain treatment in medical settings using mindfulness. Um, and you see there my um, my um, co-investigators um, at the at the two other sites, so Dr. McTighe and Greco at the University of Pittsburgh, and Dr. Kaler. Gaylord and Faro at, at UNC Chapel Hill. So I just wanted to recognize them. So our aim is to recruit 450 people who have chronic low back pain. They're at least 18 years old and they'll be individually randomized to the eight week mindfulness clinical pain program uh, plus PCP usual care or they'll be randomized to PCP usual care. This is what we call a pragmatic clinical trial um, in CCIH knows that this is already evidence-based treatment. So it's kind of moving to the next step. How do we get it into the clinic? So our primary hypothesis is that patients in Optima will have significantly improved pain intensity and interference as measured by the PEG composite score at completion of the program and six and 12 months later as compared to PCP usual care. So the PEG is a composite score. It was actually originally, it's been, it was developed at the VA um, by Aaron Krebs and then uh, picked up by the CDC as something that could very quickly be evaluated in uh, patients with um, opioid use disorder and pain um, to monitor how they're doing. Um, and this is part of the Helping Tend Addictions long-term basket of trials that uh, the NIH is funding. And it's, it's one of the main outcome measures they want us to use. So it's very simple to use and it, it asks on a one, one to 10 point scale about your pain, about your enjoyment of life and about um, interference and physical function. 
So again, it asks those different components um, of pain. We have three healthcare systems involved, um, Boston Medical Center, the, which is a large safety net um, health system here in Boston where I'm located, um, the UPMC Pittsburgh, which is a large academic health system, and then the UNC Chapel Hill site is in par partnership with Piedmont Health Services and their federal, federally funded health centers. So we have a large um, minoritized population in our study, um, which I'm really proud that we are um, really contributing to the diversity of the mindfulness research frequently. I think our field is really faulted with, with not enough uh, diversity in, in our populations that we study. So we tried to keep the inclusion criteria broad. Um, mainly they had to be a primary care patient at a participating practice, be at least 18. And then we use the NIH task force on a chronic pain definition of chronic low back pain. So pain that persists for at least three months and has resulted in pain on at least half the days in the past six months. We are only doing this in English. I've had numerous people ask if we could offer it in Spanish. As you can imagine doing it, I would love to do it in Spanish, um, but being having to do the whole program in Spanish isn't, isn't feasible right now for us in this setting. Um, and, and then typical red flags that you might, might be exclusion criteria, um, such as the cancer. Um, pregnancy is that might change their course of pain. Um, we had to add exclusion criteria for same households. And then if they weren't gonna participate um, in the clinic anymore, they couldn't, they couldn't be part of the study. So we are stratified by clinic and sex for our block randomization. And again, it's at the um, patient level that we're randomizing. We are modeling the clinical pain management program on MBSR, which our team previously demonstrated efficacy on in the single site RCT, the randomized trial that I just reviewed for you. So we are, we're basically following uh, what we did in that program, which we had already modified to a 90 minute sessions. Um, they continue to be eight weekly sessions and are group based. But um, we did actually have to shift it to telehealth with a pandemic. We had always intended this to be in person, but there wasn't a choice but to uh, pivot to do this virtually. And because of the situation that we still are in almost two years, well, two years later, I'm very grateful actually that we got the approvals to deliver this as a te telehealth. And we're using the medical group visit model that's actually been pioneered by family practice. I need, we needed to find a way to deliver the program that could happen in primary care and family practice has presented a model with what's called the medical group visit. Um, and medical group visits have been shown to access, improve the access and amount of time that people spend with a clinician, patient satisfaction, reduce health services utilization like ED visits or repeat admissions, improve medication adherence and improve health behaviors like exercise and diet and improve quality of life and some, some disease specific outcomes. So in a medical group visit, it, it's exactly as it sounds, um, patients are seen in a group, the clinician has time, the primary care provider um, has time during the first, typically the first half hour of the medical group visit to touch base with each of the, of the patients that are there and then participates or leads a medical group visit. It, it can be done with a provider and somebody, you know, two providers potentially or it can be let alone. And that actually allows the, the provider then to bill individually for each one of those patients. Um, and that is, that is acceptable, but you need to have associated with it, a diag obviously a diagnosis code related to whatever the condition is they're there. Um, so um, just to add that in our model, the, the, the sessions are taught by a mindfulness instructor and then a primary care provider is there at all of the sessions. What's the role of the primary care provider at the session with the mindfulness instructor? So, so that's been a real interesting blend, how, how we do that, because that is something new that, that we're doing. Um, and one is that they do the first 30 minutes where 
um, Zoom allows you to individually do like a breakout room. So they meet individually with each participant and that's part of their, the, the, the group, the medical visit with mm -hmm. the provider individually. But then if the provider can stay for the whole time, they can use elements of the whole group, group to include in their, in their note, which allows for billing. Mm -hmm. So in some way that they're not actively engaged on the teaching front as much as um, as a clinician to kind of check in on everybody's um, progress and how they're doing. We've been we've been navigating how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that generally we've settled a little bit in on the mindfulness instructor touches base with them before the session, before each session regarding what the topic is for the session. Um, and they might invite them at certain points to participate um, in the session. So like for the very first session, part of it was to introduce them themselves, tell them what their role was, not just as a listener, but sometimes they would be perhaps chiming in with their own experience. Um, and also, um, um, there's some things like confidentiality and stuff they might be assigned to do. Mm -hmm. But that's definitely been a learning experience for us, which, which we're probably gonna be writing a best practices paper as we get more, more settled with it. Um, so, um, you know, with pragmatic clinical trials, you wanna keep pa patient reported outcomes to a minimum. <laughs> And with time, I've had to grow it because I, I mentioned we were under heel and they have required outcomes. So, so we have more measures than I would like for participants to fill out. I, but these are the major timeline measures that they need to do. And it, most of them can do it in 30 minutes. There's a, some people who take a little bit longer. I had originally wanted it to just be 20, but, but um, heel kept adding stuff on. That's okay. Um, nevertheless, you'll see the PEG is our main outcome measure and six months is the main time point that we're looking, looking for. Um, we're also interested in electronic health record outcomes. And so we are gonna be looking at healthcare system utilization at the three major um, healthcare systems that, that I mentioned. Um, and outcomes that you can imagine are important um, in low back pain, and not only just opioid prescriptions, but healthcare encounters that might be expensive, like MRIs and injections, and ED visits and surgeries, things like that. Um, so we'll be looking at that through the electronic health record. And then again, I was just curious on that. That's kind of an interesting thing to add in, and it makes sense given your, you know, pragmatic trial, really looking at how this affects not just individuals, but their, you know, uh, treatment in the whole health system. It makes a lot of sense to do that. But are, are you just tracking the two groups, EHRs, or are you comparing also the mindfulness group to chronic low back pain people who aren't even in the study to kind of compare to some normative larger N? Now, that's very interesting. Right now, we're just comparing it to people in the study. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we could we could do a larger end though if we wanted to. So that's kind of intriguing and that's potentially something we could do. Um, I think the question is we'd have to look back and see how, uh, you know, uh, we, we have to get informed consent to get this data. So it's, it's uh, we'd have to look and see what's allowed, but. Yeah. Uh, and then again, just an overview of, of this study, um, people who, who have low back pain. Um, um, if they're interested and eligible, they get consented. Um, they complete their baseline surveys. Um, and if they're still interested, they get randomized. So they'll either be in a telehealth eight week, uh, basically um, modeled on mindfulness-based stress reduction program, or it'll be usual, usual care. And then they complete their surveys monthly because we ask medication use monthly as well as health system encounters monthly, but we also um, have the main time points of eight weeks, six months, and 12 months, and, and then participants get compensated um, for their time. So again, just the overall, because I went into the details, I just wanted to remind people of the, 
of the over, overall um, approach of, this, of the study. So in conclusion, um, I, I, hope I've, I hope I've shown you how chronic pain is not only multidimensional, but convinced you that it is a mind and body experience. Mindfulness addresses cognitive and emotional reactions to pain. Um, patients decrease pain and increase function after learning mindfulness. And examples of participants describing overcoming fear of pain and decreased pain significance with mindfulness. So thank you and um, any additional questions are welcome. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, to start with, we do have one that came in um, from David Black, uh, just asking about um, potential other measures. Uh, of course, Dr. Black is one of our key faculty members and thinks about research questions a lot, so there's a very kind of research-oriented question for um, thinking about additional studies. Are, are there other behavioral measures outside of self-report of clinical disability and pain that can guide future research behavioral measures features like observed mobility or behavioral task responses imaging etc just curious of your thoughts on that yeah as a so as the my approach and i'm a generalist i do take kind of the macro macro view to research um and i and um as you're aware i, I just alluded to biologic the biologic components of pain. And it's just a whole gi gigantic field there looking at the central mechanisms, whether it's through imaging or, or other ways, the peripheral mechanisms that we look at pain. I think that's all very, very important. Um, quantitative sensory testing with pain is popular. Um, I've been, because of what I do, it's been more macro, but all of those things are very, very um, are very important. I just haven't, um, I've mainly done the self-report. Yeah, staying really highly focused on the clinical outcomes. Correct, but I will tell you that people are, because people still have a hard time, you know, if they take a picture of you and me meditating, it looks like we're not doing anything. So people, people just have a hard time understanding how could that possibly help pain? And so that data is just critical. When I showed the self-report, it doesn't convince them. What convinces right. them if I, is when I, um, uh, you mentioned FODL, you know, if I, if, I, if I can show other people's data, it's like, oh, wow, you know? So the data is absolutely important. I don't need to be convinced, but that reporter I was just talking to three weeks ago needed to be convinced, you know? And yeah. he was talking about CBT. So I was like, well, I don't know the literature. I know it's good and it helps people, you know, but the mechanisms, I don't know if they've been studied in the same way that mindfulness mechanisms have been studied. Thank you for that question. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, having, it sounds like you've taken a fairly active um, role in um, doing some of the debrief with participants in your studies over these many years you've been. So you must have met quite a few people having gone through mindfulness courses in the course of you know, going through your studies and really see uh, the, the whole variety from, uh, from those people who you probably focused on here because they really kind of um, highlight the success stories of you know people who really do seem to get a lot out of it and some of the you know the things that they say what what in you know indicators there are for what kind of inner processes seem to have taken place through their engaging with mindfulness practice um, i imagine you also have some wealth of uh experience in in talking to those people who seem to not get much out of it and i'm just curious if, you know from that kind of speaking to so many people who've had both good outcomes and bad outcomes, if you can speak to like what, what uh, differences that you see between the people who seem to have gotten more out of it and, and less out of it. I think that's a really interesting question. So, so you're right, I, I have talked to a lot of people. And um, what I found interesting is uh, for the focus groups, I was inviting people who, who didn't feel like they had gotten much out of it. 
Um, and I'm the, I am not one. So I showed you some of those quotes just to illustrate, illustrate some of the mindfulness methods that they're, that they're probably using for, to work with their pain um, without looking at inside their brain and seeing what's doing it, but how they actually describe it. But yeah. when you ask people, this is a fascinating thing to me. Everyone could tell me that they couldn't figure out how to meditate. They could, they'll just tell you, I just can't seem to do it. These aren't people who don't even try. I'm not talking about those folks, you know, but the folks who, who try it and they're just like, I just can't get it. Um, despite all the, and they stayed in the study, they, they were good citizens, you know, but then you get them in a focus group. And the most frustrating part for me is that they couldn't tell you why. They couldn't tell you why they didn't get it. And you would ask the instructor and the instructor might say, well, they were, they were doing some of the things we tried to tell people not to do. They're solidifying things like that. But um, anyways, so, so they, I sometimes think the mindfulness instructors might be better people to ask than the patients themselves. <laughs> well, the, the mindfulness instructor they probably had questions from these people over the course of the, that somehow did give them some uh, insight into the fact like this person's just not quite taking in the message that I'm trying to, to impart here, right? It's kind of what you're pointing to. Yes, and when you meditate, you'd have to meditate to understand what I say when you make something solid. Um, but it, when you can't get away from that, it can, it can, it, it's just one of the things that's possible that I remember the instructor being saying, yeah, you know, so, so, so it is interesting that question. Yeah. I will say that I'm also not one to say that mindfulness is going to change your life. There's people who it does, but I think it's a small proportion, maybe 10%, you know, have an absolute, you know, orthogonal rotation. Um, however, there's everybody in between. You know, and it's absolutely a bell curve. And I think it's a mistake to think of mindfulness as any other way, as any other treatment. There's a bell curve to it. Um, I think what's fascinating is those people who, who, who it is life changing, but that doesn't mean people still can't get a lot of benefit who are, who are in the middle. So I don't like to overstate the results. I usually am probably more conservative in saying it has a small effect. Well, because that's going to be average. Whereas with some people, though, it can be pretty, pretty big. Yeah. Well, this has been very informative for me. I really appreciate your perspective and sharing all this research with us. Um, it looks like we may be having come to the end of our um, uh, questions. So I'll just wrap up by reminding everyone our next um, presenter will be Amishi Ja in three weeks, February 8th. Uh, sending out a reminder about that in our next couple of talks on the listserv soon. And um, we also have a couple of uh, recent things. Where there's a faculty retreat coming up uh, in March and a, a faculty survey for faculty who might be interested in getting involved with collaborations and so keep an eye out on the listserv for those couple of things and um, you're getting some uh, some feedback on the chat just thanking you for your talk Dr. Marone so thank you again and um, oh, we will wrap up for now. Thank you thank you for inviting me thank you everybody for your kind words and interesting questions thank you.